Thank you to the organizers for this um, opportunity to present at the fantastic uh, European Society of Human Genetics meeting. Uh, it's been a fantastic conference and um, you know, attending it in the virtual setting has allowed many more participants. And I hope this type of um, hybrid setting will continue. Uh, although I, I must admit that it's really nice to meet people face to face at conferences and that's been a long time since um, I experienced one of those. I'm going to spend the rest of the 30 minutes talking about uh, decoding the developing uh, human immune system. And this is really work that has leveraged the enormous uh, progress made within the single cell uh, genomics and omics fields, where if we were to imagine uh, human tissue as a fruit salad in a bowl, what this has enabled us to do is to measure many parameters uh, at individual cell resolution to deconstruct um, the tissue. And the work is also very much a contribution to the Human Cell Atlas, which uses the single cell uh, omics technologies to profile all of the human cells uh, making our body, 37 trillion cells in total approximately, uh, in order to better understand health and uh, to diagnose, monitor and treat diseases. This is a global initiative involving 77 countries at the moment, more than a thousand institutions and more than 2000 members and anyone is able to join. Uh, you just need to go to the web link and um, be, uh, you know, you're most welcome to join the um, initiative. Uh, how do you build a human cell atlas? I mean, essentially it's using the single cell genomics technologies, not just on cells that have been dissociated from tissues, but also uh, in situ spatial omics methods, uh, which allows you to interrogate a small area of tissue or at the whole organ level. And this is really a question of scaling from, you know, a few cells, to large numbers of cells, small tissue area to large tissue area, multiple different types of information, which you can then integrate to inform uh, and you know, uh, reveal biological insights. And these data sets will be available uh, for anyone to use, but also uh, you know, provided in the form where one can actually query uh, the data sets. And I'll show you some of the early examples of this. And as such, the initiative really you know, very much depends on um, cross-disciplinary team uh, involvement from the biological disciplines, uh, computational scientists, clinical specialties, and also technology um, development. What can we measure at single cell resolution? You know, when the first the field began, it was very much protein and also RNA, but these days you can combine the different types of parameters from a single cell and the things that you can measure is just increasing uh, exponentially in terms of uh, numbers of individual parameters detected, but also uh, cells that can be analyzed. So I'm going to focus on human development, but also a little bit on uh, human skin. Um, and what I would like to do is to give a background on the developing human immune system. This is quite complex because it occurs across several organs uh, in gestational time. So you have these extra embryonic tissue, the yolk sac, where progenitors are made, which can become differentiated into blood and immune cells. Then you have definitive hematopoietic stem cells, which arise in the iotogonad mesonephros in the embryo proper, giving rise to definitive hematopoietic stem cells that then subsequently seed many organs, including the liver, which becomes the dominant site of hematopoiesis until 20 post-conception weeks. The bone marrow really uh, develops at about 11, 12 post-conception weeks, and bone marrow hematopoiesis is the dominant site after 20 post-conception weeks. Then you have the lymphoid progenitors seeding the thymus and then undergoing T-cell differentiation. Naive B cells made in the bone marrow, for example, differentiating and further differentiating and maturing in the spleen, where germinal center formation and somatic hypermutation really occurring after birth. And then you have all these blood and immune cells seeding the non lymphoid tissues, such as the skin, kidney, and gut. And here they form the uh, peripheral tissue immune surveillance network. So, how do we actually understand the developing human immune system? 
or how can we study this? You can't just label a cell and track it over time. What you can then do is actually study multiple organs from one embryo or fetus and then integrate that information together. And we've been very lucky to have the Human Developmental Biology Resource based both in, based both in Newcastle and UCL uh, that allows us to, uh, that provides um, resource for researchers, not just in the UK, but also globally. And this at scale study from multiple organs has allowed us to understand the emergent properties of the immune system and really beginning to see how the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And that's what I'm going to do, really uh, focusing on three studies, one on fetal liver hematopoiesis, which also includes analyzing yolk sac, skin and kidney. The second uh, with regards to T-cell differentiation in timers, and the third is a manuscript in press uh, on fetal bone marrow hematopoiesis and to try and put all of that information together. This is very much a collaborative effort, fantastic uh, working uh, collaboratively with many researchers that I've listed here uh, and trying to unravel the biological insights. So in the fetal liver hematopoiesis manuscript, we studied fetal liver and also the skin and kidney. But for skin and kidney, right up to 12 post-conception weeks, because thereafter you have the bone marrow contributing to blood and immune cell development as well. We knew that yolk sac contributed to um, hematopoiesis before uh, the liver becomes uh, the main site of hematopoiesis. So we profiled some yolk sac from four to seven post-conception weeks. For bone marrow, basically from when bone formation and bone marrow formation takes place, about 11 post-conception weeks. And then for timers from seven post-conception weeks, which is when the timers develops. So we profile uh, more than 100,000 cells from each of these organs. Uh, and the main take home message is that blood and immune cells uh, development is established very rapidly by 20 post-conception weeks in the human. And this is in contrast to the mouse where quite a lot of development still occurs uh, after birth. The first thing to say about the fetal liver uh, hematopoiesis is although you see the myeloid lymphoid and erythroid lineages, neutrophils do not develop in the fetal liver. They really come on in the fetal bone marrow where you can begin to see the granulocytes such as neutrophils, but also eosinophils and basophils. One, one of the um, advantage of the kind of like data set that we generated, particularly with the fetal bone marrow uh, and um, also more recently with all the other organs is the um, data set from site-seq analysis, which allows you to measure protein and RNA simultaneously in one cell. So here we've used the total seq reagents of about 188 surface proteins, and you can then correlate the expression of RNA and protein simultaneously uh, to give us better resolution, particularly uh, for researchers to then subsequently isolate the cell states that we found. Uh, now that we've also got data sets from many organs, we can now begin to put this information together, not just for prenatal development, but using uh, data that's available through the HCA data portal, cord blood and adult bone marrow to begin to understand how things are evolving across the human lifespan. So one example here shown in the myeloid lineage where you can begin to compare across uh, yolk sac, fetal liver, fetal bone marrow, but also now adult bone marrow. I mentioned earlier on the emergence of granular sites such as neutrophils in the fetal bone marrow, but also the emergence of greater variety of dendritic cell subsets such as the transitional dendritic cells expressing XL siglex 6 and also the DC3 subset. Um, one of the things that we asked when we saw granulocytes by RNA was, can we detect them and, and, and you know, validate their presence uh, morphologically because they have the characteristic polymorph uh, morphonuclear appearance. So we use the surface markers revealed by uh, single cell RNA sequencing uh, design effects panel, isolated cells for smart C2 analysis to confirm their identity based on the uh, primary discovery data set and also to look at their morphological appearance. And so this is the uh, smart seq 2 overlaid on the uh, 10X data set, confirming the identity of those cells that we isolated based on the surface markers and their morphological appearances, very much in keeping with what is known for metamyelocytes and neutrophils of that lineage and also basophils and eosinophils. So really, why, why do we get granulocytes in the fetal bone marrow? And one of the reasons we think this is 
is to do with the um, relative abundance of transcription factors that drive neutrophil differentiation versus monocyte differentiation. And here, if you look at the GMPs from the bone marrow, some of the cells have already got the monocyte signature and others the neutrophil signature. And we know that CBPA and SPI1 are the two key drivers for these lineages. And when we compared the GMPs in the fetal bone marrow with the GMPs in the fetal liver, you can see many more cells expressing much higher levels of CBPA and the ratio to SPI1 being higher. And this probably is one of the reasons why you begin to sort of see neutrophils emerging in the fetal bone marrow. Another lineage that becomes abundant uh, in, in the fetal bone marrow is B lineage. And what you can see here is there being no B cells in the yolk sac, very few in the fetal liver, and the proportion of representation of cells in the fetal bone marrow and adult bone marrow being very similar for the B lineage. But the types of B lineage cells are different in that in the fetal bone marrow, you have a lot of progenitors, the pre-pro Bs, the pro B, and the pre B. Whereas in the adult bone marrow, the predominant B lineages are of naive, transitional memory and plasma cells. And interestingly, childhood leukemias are very much B, uh, lymphoblastic leukemia, and the presence of the kind of progenitor substrates may be one reason for why this is the case. What about BCR acquisition? So you can see how heavy chain is first acquired before uh, light chain. And also that uh, you know, this BCR acquisition in terms of heavy and light chain rearrangements is accompanied by cell cycling, these cells in blue here, the percentage of cells. So there's a, um, um, a, a group of pre B cells which are uh, in cycling shown here. Uh, and then you have this phase where, you know, as B cells differentiate, there's a transition where they cycle and then subsequent selection uh, into naive B cells. What about the uh, lymphoid progenitors? I'm just going to focus a little bit on the T cells to show how this is occurring across anatomical space. So T cells differentiate in the thymus. And when we look at the liver progenitors and the thymus progenitors, you can see some of these cells which are annotated as lymphoid progenitors um, independently in the two data sets. Uh, and, and the ones in the thymus form the trajectory that differentiate into double negative T cells. And this is the same with the fetal bone marrow. So essentially you've got these lymphoid progenitors from the hematopoietic tissues that enter the thymus, then you have T cell differentiation. And we showed uh, in our paper on the thymus, the different flavors and types of single positives and invariant uh, T cells, regulatory T cells that develop. And what we find then in the fetal bone marrow is that these T cells subsequently egress the thymus and then seed the fetal bone marrow because they have the features, uh, molecular features that correlate with the differentiated single positive cells. Uh, and, and this allows us to sort of like put all of this um, information together across organs. I'm now going to focus on two insights from our studies, uh, really on the intrinsic properties of hematopoietic stem cells, and secondly, on some of the discoveries of the niche uh, of where blood and immune cell develops. So looking at the intrinsic uh, properties of hematopoietic stem cells, one, we looked at their uh, molecular characteristics, but also combined that with functional assay, whereby we isolate single progenitors, expanded them into colonies, and then performed flow cytometry analysis of the progenies that were formed. And what you can see is that the um, progenitors, these are the, all the different types of progenitors that you can find, and the relative abundance of these progenitors down the lymphoid, myeloid, and erythroid lineage changes in the organs. So for fetal liver, there's a predisposition and enrichment of the abundance for erythroid differentiation, whereas in the fetal bone marrow, you have a greater predisposition uh, of progenitors in the lymphoid and myeloid lineages. And this you know, accounts for why you have the differential composition uh, in both organs. But also the intrinsic potential of the HSCs is different. So this is the functional assay where we culture single cells and then see what they make, single HSCs. So if you took HSCs from early gestational stage liver and late gestational stage liver, what you find is that their ability to differentiate down the erythroid lineage declines, but their ability to differentiate down the B lineage and myeloid lineage increases. And if you then compare paired HSCs from fetal liver and bone marrow, you find that the properties have also changed in that the fetal liver 
uh, bone marrow produce fewer colonies compared to fetal liver, and also fetal liver H uh, fetal bone marrow HSCs have a greater predisposition to differentiate into myeloid colonies. So this tells you these molecular changes uh, of these cells uh, can be harnessed to sort of guide differentiation for HSC engineering and clinical therapy. And what about the extrinsic environment? So this study, our study is the first study to profile bone marrow stroma in human. And this is the fetal bone marrow stroma, which we then correlated with the known uh, subsets of mouse bone marrow stroma that had been identified, which shows very good correlation uh, across the board. But we found uh, really two, two new insights, right? one with regards to the endothelial cell subsets. Uh, and we saw two states, which can be seen by the differential expression of RNA and also protein. And we annotated these cells as tip ECs and sinusoidal ECs. Um, really, they have a lot of the markers of what's being known as sinusoidal endothelial cells in, in the mouse. Um, and when we look at the where these cells are present, so this is the fetal bone marrow cut um, cross-section. And this is the metaphysis, uh, the sort of like the, the end of the bone, marrow, the bone. And then this is the diaphysis going into the bone shaft. Uh, and what you can see is the enrichment of these um, endothelial cells that are, have high expression of CD34, the tip ECs here. And then in the nearer the diaphysis are the ones that have high expression of VEGFR2, the sinusoidal uh, endothelial cells. And the relative distribution of these uh, vessels uh, correlate with the type L and type H mouse fetal bone marrow vessels that have been described. So we now show that in human, there are these two different types of endothelial cells that are lining uh, vessels at different parts of the fetal bone marrow. And here's just to illustrate that point better. So here are the kind of like a more uh, dilated VEGFR2 uh, type um, sinusoidal endothelial cells. Uh, and then here are the kind of like a higher CD34 expressing cells that form, you know, loop, capillary loops uh, at the metaphyseal end of the bone marrow. What we can now do is uh, to essentially use the reference data set to map alterations and disease. And I'll show you three examples of this. The first uh, relates to Down syndrome uh, uh, caused by trisomy 21 and we, where we profile the Down syndrome fetal bone marrow from 12 to 13 post-conception weeks. And what we found is that uh, in Down syndrome, you have like a, a higher proportion of cells uh, of the erythroid lineage. And this is partly down to the intrinsic potential of HSCs. If you took those HSCs and cultured them on methyl cellulose, you will see that they form a lot of erythroid uh, colonies relative to the non-Down syndrome HSCs uh, between 17 to 21 uh, post-conception weeks. And also the fetal bone marrow microenvironment in Down syndrome is altered in that uh, if you compare uh, Down syndrome with non-Down syndrome uh, bone marrow endothelial ligands, uh, and their interacting receptors are uh, expressed on the HSC and MPPs, uh, there is a, a differential alteration. So, you know, essentially uh, a, a third copy of chrom genes on chromosome, uh, a third copy of chromosome 21 uh, causes a disruption in the intrinsic potential of cells and also the environment of the stem cells that give rise to the blood and immune cells. And if you now look uh, at all of the different cell states in the fetal bone marrow and across chromosome, you will see that there is indeed higher expression across the board for many genes on chromosome 21 across the lineages. But the effect is also seen on many other genes in other chromosomes and cell states. The second uh, utility of the reference data set is how we can then map infant and childhood leukemias. I mentioned earlier on that B cell uh, lymphoblastic leukemia is extremely common in childhood. And what we can now do is to see what types of uh, cell states do these leukemic cells best correlate with and to work out uh, what may be the uh, you know, uh, features that we can target uh, for therapy in, uh, to, to sort of help uh, these children with leukemia. The third is uh, the um, observation that developmental cell programs uh, also 
co-opted and re-emerge in inflammatory adult diseases. And in this case, uh, it's an inflammatory skin disease. So what we did here is we looked at the uh, developing skin data set, both immune and non-immune cells, compared it with adult healthy skin and two common inflammatory skin diseases, uh, which uh, are atopic dermatitis and psoriasis. And what we then did was to compare all of the different cell states that we found uh, in the adult skin with developing skin, but also extended the analysis to the other data sets that we had from other developing organs to see whether this was unique to the developing skin or whether more generalized to other developing organs. First thing to say about the vascular endothelium that we saw was the uh, transcriptional enrichment of a rare endothelial cell subset in the adult skin, uh, which we named V3, uh, which seemed to correlate with you know, vascular endothelial cells from many uh, developing organs. And the same for this macrophage 2 subset, which is most enriched with all of the developing macrophages. What was really interesting about uh, these uh, MAC2 and V3 were that they were proportionally increased in both atopic dermatitis and psoriasis lesional skin, which led us to look at these cells in, in greater detail. So if you look at V3, you know, microanatomically, this looks like the cells that form uh, dilated capillary loops. And indeed, the uh, description of these cells, uh, both molecular and sort of um, anatomical level, resemble very much the high endothelial venules. Uh, in the lymph node, which is where how the immune cells kind of like enter the, the actual lymph node. Um, so we wondered whether what these cells were doing was to basically, you know, facilitate the recruitment of immune cells uh, in, into the skin. And we asked what were the gene expression programs that were conserved in developing vascular endothelial cells and macrophage 2, and also disease um, endothelial V3 and MAC2. And essentially, this all came down to gene programs that were involved in leukocyte recruitment and angiogenesis. And because we had these two um, cell types, we wondered whether they were, in, you know, in fact, interacting, uh, which led us to look at uh, receptor ligands that the cells may be expressing to see if there was any prediction of statistically significant interactions between those two cells. And we came down to um, this uh, uh, relationship between inter or interaction between the receptor ACKR1 and its ligand CXCR8, which you see here uh, most highly expressed by MAC2 and V3, uh, and particularly in disease states, but also observed in the developing macrophages and vascular endothelial cells. In, in disease, both atopic dermatitis and psoriasis, these cells were you know, interacting close together uh, with um, in, in situ, suggesting that the they, they may be mediating those effects um, in situ. So what we propose is that CXCR8 um, produced by MAC2 interacts with its receptor ACKR1 and V3, and this drives leukocyte recruitment uh, and also angiogenesis. During development, this is to seed lymphocytes or leukocytes in the tissue, but during disease, this recruits immune cells, which then causes inflammation. What is still not clear to us is whether uh, this program is just unique to atopic dermatitis or psoriasis and psoriasis, or whether it's more broadly applicable to any immune-mediated inflammatory disorders, and how it may be regulated differentially during development and in disease, which will give us, um, you know, new therapeutic um, targets potentially. So what I've done is to show how the uh, human cell atlas uh, profiling has given us a lot of information that can be used for tissue engineering, cell therapy to better understand childhood disorders, mapping uh, leukemias and chromosomal alterations, how it can now begin to inform us about lifespan and aging, and also the relevance of developmental pathways in adult pathology, which may be um, underappreciated. All of our data sets is available through a web portal. This is the um, link to it, developmentsalatlas.ncl.ac.uk. And you will see uh, from there, you can go to the data set for the feet, the liver, uh, skin, and so on and so forth. What you can do there is um, to browse the expression of genes uh, of the different cell states. 
uh, here is the expression of MS4A1 or CD20 on, on B cells. And you can also look at the expression of uh, you know, several genes on the cell states that are of interest to you, visualized as a spot plot or a heat map. I'm going to very briefly segue into what happened during the pandemic. Um, and, you know, we, we had a lot of these kind of, uh, we had acquired expertise in single cell multiomics, working collaboratively in the team science, uh, you know, framework, establishing all of this infrastructure. So we, you know, leveraged these this, this abilities to then better understand the immune response uh, in, in COVID-19 patients. And this was very much a large collaborative efforts across many centers uh, and involving many researchers. And this really then involved many junior researchers working together collaboratively. And I think, you know, this is one example of how I think, you know, science is no longer about one person, one project, but actually a group of individuals coming together. And the progress we made could not have been achieved if we just had one or two individuals. And I think it's also important that these individuals are recognized for their contribution and why we had uh, all of them as uh, co-first authors. And I'm trying to promote this idea that, you know, we can do science at a much faster scale and speed, uh, but we also need to think about how we make sure that, uh, you know, everyone involved is acknowledged. So with regards to COVID-19, I'm not going to dwell too much on what we found, but the fact that the data and the web portal is available, and you can browse uh, that through COVID-19cellatlas.org. And very briefly, essentially what we did was to try and understand how the changes that we saw uh, across all of the different cell types in the peripheral blood informed us of the response to the primary site infection in the lung, and the response of the bone marrow. And there were many you know, you know, interactions and loops that were involved. The whole thing is one intricate um, interplay between all of these cells, uh, which you can read in the manuscript that was published. So I'm going to stop now uh, to thank my lab uh, for the fantastic journey uh, over the years and um, to acknowledge all of my many collaborators, much of the work is very much in close collaboration with the Sanger Cellular Genetics Program, uh, particularly with Sarah Teichman and our funders, and also for anyone interested in joining our team, uh, either at Sanger or Newcastle, please do contact me. Um, thank you very much.